I ready to go? Ready to go. Say good morning to each and every one of you. Thank you for coming this way, and thank you for being a part of the service. And got a, I got a extra special blessing this morning. So, just remember the service in your prayers, and my grandson and. Maybe she'll like it. I call her my granddaughter-in-law. <laughs> but anyway, it's good to have you here and good to see each one of you. If you will, by be while while I'm turning while we're turning to the tenth chapter of Hebrews, let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of coming this way. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you've given us. Thank you for your word. And it rightly divided. Lord, we just pray as we go through this service this morning that you take our hearts together and be each one be edified and your name be glorified and lifted up. And I give you the praise in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay. Chapter 10. And as usual, I'm going to back up last two verses in the ninth chapter get started with <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews says and as, it, and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this to judgment so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation for the law in the tenth chapter the first verse for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect for when they for then would they have not ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin but in these sacrifices, in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. We're going on and try to get down to about the half of this chapter. It's, it's a long one, and it's going to take, I know, two weeks at it, two times at it. But I'm going to try to get, I'm going to stop right there, and we'll go as far as we can. Let me say again about the book of Hebrews. It is a book that takes the Old Testament and compares it to the New Testament that God has got coming for the nation Israel. And it looks at things that are better. Everything that was in the New Old Testament, the New Testament has something coming that's, going, that's better, and that's what the writer is doing here, is pouring out to them the things that are going to be better and the things that are better. So keep that in mind as we go along. And like I've said before, there is there is some scripture in the old in the uh, book of Hebrews. And I'll say this, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again: the Old Testament and the writings according to Paul sometimes have have things in it that you can use in any dispensation. It's what they call a trans dispensation. <coughs> There's also things there that are parallel scripture. In other words, it'll run right along beside it and explain <coughs> one thing about the Old Testament and it'll, it'll give you a verse that goes parallel with it in, in the uh, writings of Paul. And uh, I said one time uh, I was trying to find out and figure out who wrote the book of Hebrews and I like to say Paul, which I did once. But Paul did not write it. Amen. Paul did not, and it is not written to us. Amen. Or about us, or to us. Now, it is written for us. Paul's writing says that we all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, and, and for all things to anyone. 
There's some scriptures there that, that is good for all. But you and I in the body of Christ today look, look at and take to be our personal mail the writings of the Apostle Paul. And uh, Brother Bob just started in Acts. It, it starts there in the... Paul starts in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts and winds up in the book of Philemon. Before the ninth chapter of the book of Acts and after Philemon, it's all for and to Israel. It's for, all about Israel and for Israel. It's for us. It's for our learning. But it's not written to us. It's not our personal mail, if you want to call it that. The tenth chapter, the first verse again. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Those sacrifices were offered. They were made of God, and that's God's way. Of, had that's the way that God had Israel to come to Him. They had to offer the blood sacrifices of sheep, goats, whatever lambs, and whatever it was in the holy of holies before Him. The uh, I, I rambled around, finally figured out what what the high, what the priest is doing. They, they take care of the things of God in the holy place. They, they take care of the offerings and whatever has to be done in the holy place, but they dare not go into the most holy place, the holy of holies. That is, that is set for the high priest and him alone. And he can only go one time a year with the blood of, and at that time, the blood of bulls and goats and, and things like that to and put a sprinkle them on the mercy seat, meet with God on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And if he went any other time, and if any other priest, even a priest went, too bad. They didn't come back out. Uh, I'd heard it before and I forgot it, but Brother Robert mentioned the other day that uh, some of the high priests even would tie a rope around their legs so if, if they messed up and God killed them while they was in there, which he would, then they pulled him out with that rope. They didn't get there to go in there to get him. So you might want to keep that in mind. <clears throat> that was time past pertaining to Israel. Amen. Don't ever forget that. Like I said, Paul is our apostle. He writ he wrote to us and about us. His writings are our personal mail. It's to us about us and all the rest of it the whole Bible is for Israel in the ninth chapter of the uh, book of Acts when God struck Paul down on the road to Damascus and he told Ananias to go get him Ananias said no said, I hear he's been a, I hear he's been a killing the uh, uh, the uh, Israel, the Christians of Israel, the believing remnant of Israel, and he was even on his way to into Damascus to get others to be to bind them, to take them before the government and have them killed or, or tormented or tortured. God said, "You go get him." Because I've got a special thing for him to do, and that was to bring those the good message of God's grace. By faith plus nothing. No works. Israel had to do works, but they, they also had to have the faith. They had faith, in, and if they did the works and did the sacrifices, then God would save them in the end. Amen. Well, you and I today in the age of grace is purely grace by, through, by grace through faith. Nothing else. No works. Nothing. You believe and trust in Jesus by grace through faith you're saved for all eternity. Amen. So we might want to keep that in mind. <clears throat> for then these old sacrifices could never make the comers thereunto perfect, as the writer says in verse 1. 
If they had, in verse 2, he said, they, then they would not have ceased to be offered. If they had been good, if they had did, done what, what God intended for them to do, and if Israel had, if Israel had went by it, if Israel, Israel had done it, there wouldn't be a, uh, a need for another way to come. But they didn't. They failed. And it, uh, when they stoned Stephen, God shut God set the nation Israel aside and started a, a, the secret purpose with Paul. He God had kept that secret of you and I from the foundation of the world. He told it to nobody until he until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul to take it to you and me. Paul said in Second Timothy chapter two, uh, chapter two, I think it is, and maybe verse two, verse one and two. That, uh, that that grace message Paul told Timothy says you teach it to others that they might teach others and the way I look at that, that that puts it on the road the gospel to you and I you teach it to others who will teach others who will teach others who will teach others on down the line until it got to me and you and if those sacrifices, as the writer says, had uh, uh, could take away the sins and make those comers there too perfect, they wouldn't have it, they wouldn't have ceased to be offered because the worshippers then, if they had been purged or cleansed, would have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Those Israel sins under the Old Testament. come up before God at once each year. And they had to go. If they was a Jew, I don't care where they lived and how far it was, they had to go to Jerusalem and make that sacrifice once a year. And like I said, the priest, only the high priest could go in and help make that sacrifice on the Holy of Holies for them. And just to clear up why and bat the blood on the, the uh, on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies you remember when Christ died on the cross and he arose? One of the, I think it was Mary, uh, one of them tried to grab his feet. He said, don't touch me. For I have not yet ascended to my Father. A little while later, someone else uh, was I think well maybe washing his feet or his hair or something and he never said a word about it. He was okay because he hadn't made the trip from there to the Holy of Holies in heaven and presented his blood in place of the blood of animals on the mercy seat before God. And that's the thing that this this book of Hebrews is for Israel and it tells all about that. But that blood, that same blood that cleansed them. Cleanse you and I when we believe and trust in God. Verse 3 again, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance made, again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. This is Christ talking about to God the Father and, and remembering what he went through. God, he was saying, Father, in essence, he was saying, Father, I know you weren't pleased for eternity with those sacrifices. So you prepared a body for me that I might be the sacrifice. And that goes all the way back to Eve. Eve thought she was carrying the seed for uh, the Savior. But uh, Cain killed Abel and that took care of that. So God went around another way and he went through uh, what was his name? Uh, one of the other sons that that had not uh, said. Right. And uh, God went through 
from Mary and her seed I mean from Eve and her seed all the way down to Mary and her seed perfecting the body for the Lord Jesus Christ And that's why in verse 5, the last part of it, he said, But a body hast thou prepared for me. Because in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no, had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I came in the volume of the book, which goes, it takes you to, if you want to write it down and, and read it later, uh, Psalms, 4, Psalms 40, I believe, verse 7 and 8. Then said I, Lord, I came, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. I come to, to make that final, that eternal sacrifice, that one time he sacrificed. As he was about to go and, and die on the cross of Calvary, he said, Father, if there be any other way, lift this past from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Because I come, Lord, to do thy will. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and, sac and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure in and has pleasure in them. Pleasure therein which are offered by the law. And again he said, Then said I, He, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Jesus came, and, and in this, God took away the first covenant. Because Israel would not keep it. They would not have anything to do with it. God made the covenant with them to start with when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they never keep it. They wouldn't keep it. And many times God had to chastise them and, and kill numbers of them because they wouldn't keep his covenant. I mean, you say, why would God kill them? He told them what to do, and they wouldn't do it. It's God's word. world. He made it. It's God's uh, thing. He set it up. And that's the way it worked. And he was serious. God is serious about what he does. So Jesus came and when he died he took away the first covenant so that he may establish the second one. And we're coming to that in just a few more verses where we find that. Chapter, verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will of God. He taken away first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. Now, like I said, keep in remembrance that God is not talking to us. The writer of Hebrews here is talking to the nation Israel under their covenant. Chapter, uh, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From henceforth, from then on, expecting or waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. Okay, there's another interesting little story that'll help explain that. When they stoned Stephen to death, when Israel stoned Stephen to death at the feet of Paul, Stephen looked up as he was dying and said, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. When Jesus went back to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and he was waiting there until his enemies be made his footstool. Stephen said, I see him standing up. That's what really tore Israel up because he was about, he, he, they knew that that was about to be the time 
that Christ was coming back to start the great tribulation period and, and, and to deal with Israel's sins, to deal with the sins of the world through his wrath. But in the meantime and during that, Paul said that God kept this, in, this secret, uh, this, this plan secret, which is the body of Christ, from eternity, from the beginning of time, from before the beginning of time even. God knew he was going to do it. They didn't take God by surprise. He had it planned all the time. And uh, uh, I turn to, if I'm not re if I'm not wrong, this First Corinthians. And I'd like to remind you of some other reading. First Corinthians chapter one. First Corinthians chapter one and verse six. Excuse me, verse two. Chapter two. Chapter two, verse six. Sorry about that. How be it we speak wisdom among Well back up to five. Paul said, I'm writing this, that uh, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, or fully grown, full aged, mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So you and I, God kept secret since before the foundation of the world, for he, he made the world. <coughs> okay. And in verse 8, he explains what's going on. Which none of the princes, which none of the princes of this world knew. This secret, none of the princes, none of the, the demons, none of the Satan's bunch, none of the, the crowd was, that runs with Satan and that helps him, still helping him in the day now, none of them knew it which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The point I wanted to get at was verse, uh, verse 8. And this, this wisdom none of the princes knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's, uh, it's kind of amusing in a way. Satan, when he, cru he, he, he was successful in crucifying Christ, he got that over with. He pulled that off. And he said, when... When God appeared to Paul, he knew, Satan knew that. When God appeared to Paul and set him on the road to you and I and to everybody else, he seen he had it fooled. That's what God was after all the time. And Satan had helped in his in defeating himself. To me, it's kind of amusing. I don't know about you. Uh, can you imagine what he thought and how he felt. He was thinking that he had killed Christ and that he was going to be all right and he was going to have it all. And all of a sudden he looked up and God saved the Apostle Paul and revealed to him that secret. Can you imagine how mad Satan was? That's why he's working so hard today. That's why he's after those who stand for God's truth today and he's after them so hard. And sometimes you, you have to really watch him. For had he known it, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <clears throat> Verse 14, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us 
For after that he had said, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, said the Lord. Now, to God is talking about the new covenant right there. They failed to keep the old covenant. And that old covenant ended not at the beginning of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but at the end of it. The book of Hebrews goes on to tell us that, that uh, the testator, that the writer of a new covenant has to be dead before it's in effect. This is the verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. You know, there was a time one day God had told them to teach each other His word. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 33. Excuse me, Jeremiah 31. And verse 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with them with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and to their inward parts and write them in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach every mo- any more, teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the last, from the least unto, of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will give their, uh, forgive their iniquities, and their sins will I remember no more. Under the New Testament, their sins were brought up once, once and for all, or once a year, before God. And that's why the old animal sacrifices and all the things that they had to go through, through the sacrifice and through the uh, sacrificial system, through the through the uh, temple worship and through the tabernacles and the Holy of Holies. And God had told them to teach each other. He had taught them that. Excuse me. But he said under this New Testament they'll have to not teach they'll not have to teach each other anymore. For I write my laws in their inward parts. I will make them to keep my covenant. I will enable them to keep my covenant without any problem. They'll be there. The covenant will be there. And they can keep it no problem because God is leading them. God is showing them the way to do it, the way to go. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Verse 17, back in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. You know, before I found out and figured out, I found out the gospel, the grace message, and the message according to Paul, I read a story in the Bible about and it would thrill me about two goats that the priest had to take and get and bring before God. One of the priests, I think it was one of them, uh, our high priest, had to take that 
scapegoat they called it uh, take that goat and confess the sins of Israel or had to kill one let me excuse me had to kill one and uh, I'll get right in a minute Bobby <laughs> they had to kill one goat and offer him as a sacrifice the other they called a scapegoat the priest took him and he laid his hands on his head and confessed the sins of Israel all the people of Israel over that goat's head and turn him loose and send him off into the wilderness. What that meant to me, or what, what I saw in that, that God never remembered their sins anymore. That goat was gone with them. He never came back. Well, we have the same privilege, the same blessing, only it's in a different way. The minute you say that uh, you accept, and if you want to write this down, the uh, sixth chapter of the book of Romans, uh, chapter, uh, sixth chapter, verses one through four, I think it is, tells us that God, that Jesus Christ died for my sin. He was buried, which, got, which took care of my sins. My sins were buried with him. And he rose again the third day in a new life. And that's what we do. Also, you'll find it in the uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses, what, the first four or five verses. Paul said, well, let's, let, let's just turn over there, 1 Corinthians, and read that, chapter 15. plenty of time find it because I can't find it. <laughs> but it's there somewhere, I know. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Verse number one. Paul laid down there in the sixth chapter of Romans tells you pretty much the same thing that we that has talked about. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand by which also you're saved if you keep in memory what I preach unto you unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day after, according to the Scripture. It tells you about the same thing. And uh, the second chapter of uh, Ephesians chapter the second chapter verses 10 and 11, 10 and 12 well let's go there and make sure I get that right Chapter 1 or chapter 2, I'm having trouble finding. For by grace through faith, are you saying? 2 8. 2 8. 2 Okay. Where they, where Israel had to <coughs> confess their sins before the priest once a year. Look what Paul says we, God did for us. 
verse 4 he said, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together and made, alive, made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace, now listen to what He said, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Now, let me ask this question, what else was it He takes besides a, by grace through faith? Believing and trusting what it takes? Nothing. Amen. Nothing. Just believe. Just believe and accept what he did for me at Calvary. Or for you at Calvary. And that's it. It's simple. It's so simple that a lot of people, that's why a lot of people miss it. It's so simple. How can God forgive and do it that way? Well, he did. He'll do it any way he wants to because he made the world. He put it all together. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Would I give you a gift and then take it away from you? Would God? No. Okay. A lot of people miss that. They are... That's why a lot of people thinks, teaches and says that they can be saved one day and lost another. Uh-uh. Why would God do it and then let you get lost again? That don't, that don't make sense. For by grace through faith plus nothing, you're saved throughout all eternity if you trust in God. That's only, a, that's only true in Israel's program. The having it, not having it, that's only true. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. Okay, back to the 10th chapter of Hebrews. In verse 18, <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter, chapter 10, verse 18, the writer says, Now where remission of these sins are, there, there would be no more, if, if that way hadn't worked, there'd be no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. At the time past, they, the priest and the high priest entered into the holy of holies the blood of the goats. But now the writer is saying by a new and a living way in verse 20 he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. There was a veil between the holy place and the most holy place. The priest went into that most holy place by himself. Christ died on the cross of Calvary. The veil of the temple in Jerusalem was torn from top to bottom. Just out of the blue, it, it, it came apart from top to bottom, saying that Jesus made the way. His body became the veil, veil between God and man, and it was torn apart. It was He made the way. He opened up the way to go into the holy of holies before God. And all I have to do is believe and trust in what He did there at Calvary. Questions or comments? I'm going to stop right there. I know some of you got some comments, I'm sure. I just want to clarify Israel's program, they could have it and lose it up till the Christ's second coming. Right. That's when they got their. Right. permanent salvation. salvation when Christ came back and that kingdom started 
then they got their promise of salvation fulfilled. Up until then, they could. Yeah. You and I, the minute we believe, we have that blessed hope. And God cannot, and God will not take it away. Nobody else can. I can't. Why would I want to, even if I could? You know? Anything else? Anybody else? Father, we thank you again for your love and grace. Thank you for Calvary again. Thank you for the reading of your word and those who have come. We thank you for each one that's here, Lord. We just love and appreciate them for coming this way. Lord, we thank you that whatever happens and whatever comes in our lives, Lord, that you are there. You've given us all things, and we thank you for that. But in all things, in all situations, Lord, we also thank you for that. Knowing that whatever happens, whatever comes along in our lives, you're there, you've been there ahead, and you're there leading. And we thank you that in that, in that you're still God. And you're still for us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <coughs>